All right, welcome everyone. This will be our second to last live Q&A. We're getting close to the home stretch and wrapping things up. I know it's been a long haul, so I appreciate everybody sticking with us. Um, this is going to be for Module 6, and like we've done in the past, we'll, we'll start with the Module 5 quiz and then dive right into total risk. So for the quiz, first question, these are all related to RMC QRA calcs. Um, in those set of spreadsheets, the yellow shaded input cells that are outlined with a red box, the user should, and that's going to be paste as the formula. Okay. So that's going to be paste as formulas. That's, that's the one spot where we're going to paste as formulas. Went through great pains to remind everybody to always paste inputs as values mostly because of the conditional formatting and things that are built into those spreadsheets. But if the cells are yellow and outlined in red, then we want those particular formulas. So question number two, uh, also with RMC QRA calcs, which of the following is false? First one here, maximum stage must be the same for all stage frequency relationships. So that is true. Um, second one for project, the same set of stage partitions must be used for all potential failure modes. That is also true because of how the spreadsheet pulls things together to make the big FN. And then the third one there, it is best to clear the simulation results in the spreadsheet prior to running a new simulation. That is true. So the correct answer is going to be none of the above. Question number three, true or false for RMC QRA calcs when inputting values into the various tables, the stages need to be input from low to high. And that is true. If you don't, then the um, interpolation macro formulas that are already punched in for you will not be correct and you will get an error. So yes, always put those stages at low to high. And then the final question, true or false, uh, the RMC project risk spreadsheet must be open to link properly with the RMC risk summary and plot spreadsheet. And that is also true, uh, just the way those things are set up. Okay. Went through that pretty quick. Any, any questions on uh, the module five quiz before diving into homework six? Hey, yeah, uh, Damon, just on question two, it seems like and it's may, may, maybe more for my own understanding. There's a diff. You need to use the same partitions when you're uh, discretizing the stage frequency curve, and that has to be the same for every failure mode. But it doesn't have to be the same partitions on each node of the failure mode, right? Is that right? Correct. So the, the stages that you evaluate for a given failure mode can be different, mm -hmm. but the partitions when we're splitting up the hazard and doing the final risk calcs at the the bottom of the sheet those need to be the same that's correct yeah it's re it's really when you're interpolating on the 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 stage frequency curve because whatever input you get may not match where you want to evaluate a given failure mode but then i guess as you say at the end you need to use the same partition so you can compare apples to apples okay that's yep no, that's that's a good clarification. I, I, I personally don't consider um, like the the stages that define a potential failure mode, the system response for it. I don't consider those to be partitions. Those are the stages that we're going to evaluate the the probability for, and then we'll interpolate in between to get the rest of the um, system response curve. Um, but when we break up the hydrologic hazard, the stage frequency curve, those are certainly partitions. Cool. Anyone else? Yes. I'll start Can you hear me, Damon? Start yeah. Uh, I messed things up, so I'm going to not correctly ensure that the partitions are the same. The hazard curve is done by itself, so that's easy. Where do I not make the partitions the same and it breaks things, but doesn't give me an error? 
Because it sounds like we yeah. won't get an error. It'll just fake its way through and be wrong. Correct. So basically when you're setting things up and there, there's really no good way to put an error check in there, um, I'm, I guess there is a way, but when you're doing the, uh, and you're on the PFM worksheet, you have the option of it making even bins or you can override those if you want resolution at a specific stage range. So if you never override those and just go with it, you're good. If you want resolution somewhere and you override it in one of your failure modes, that's what you need to use and carry forward throughout. Let me see if I can show you an example. So, and 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 so, overriding would be common in almost in a lot of risk assessments because you want to have maybe even half a foot intervals in what you look at for response on overtopping. Overtopping right? would be one, yes, or something. Um, spillway erosion can be another one, or really anything that has a critical change in the system response at a certain elevation. If everything's kind of a straight line, then it really doesn't matter. But if you've got sharp breaks, then that's both in your hazard and in your system response. Those would be places you would want to consider additional resolution. Okay. And so if you just put them in your hazard curve, you have extra points in your hazard curve. Mm, no, oh, not quite. Right locally, wouldn't you? Yeah. Let me, let me pull this up and this might help. So when we're going through here, you're going to copy and paste, again, the stage partitions that you set for your first failure mode. Okay? And whatever was set for your first failure mode, when you get to the second one, it just pulls them in. It is set equal to whatever was in that first one. So if those are different from one failure mode to the next, but you're pulling all the data in correctly for PFM2, for example, but then if you wanted resolution or you had something different for PFM1, then the spreadsheet's not gonna do it right when it gets to the big FM chart. Because basically when it gets to the big FM stuff, it is using those um, those partitions from the first failure mode. Those. So then pull the FN pairs. So I hope that helps. I mean, you just got to make sure that they're consistent throughout. That's one of the limitations with how the way the spreadsheets were built. Now, if I wanted to add some error checking, I suppose that I could, instead of setting these partitions equal, I could force you to paste those in from the PFM risk spreadsheet. And then if they were different between one failure mode to the next, it could flag it. That might not be a bad ad in the future. Thank you. Don't do that because of me. Oh, you're good. Rainy day stuff. So they're doing real work, you know? All right. Well, if no one has any other questions, let's switch over. Stop sharing this screen and start sharing another screen. And we will get into RMC total risk. I think most everybody were able was able to get uh, total risk installed on their computer and running with the exception of maybe one, oh, I forget who that was. But if you're out there and once I go through this, if you want to troubleshoot, maybe you can share your screen and we'll work through it. But uh, let's pick up with homework six. One second. All right, so homework six, we're basically given the same data we had from homework five, and we're told to calculate the project risk. 
are told to use the competing risk model and to do 10,000 iterations. Um, one of the things that I did email out, we were having issues with uh, the per percentile Z distribution. And I was talking to the developers. They do have an if statement very similar to what I've got in QRA calcs to make sure that all these curves, you know, stay monotonically increasing, especially when you get to the extremes. The issue is when you're trying to run that distribution and solve things, apparently the solution is not exact. So there's um, different ways to estimate the, the result of it. So they had one in there that evidently wasn't quite as robust as they'd hope. And then by switching methods or whatever, it, that resolved the issue. So the newer version of total risk, which I guess will be released soon, has that, res has that all resolved. Um, for our purposes, I think I told you all that in between um, that we were gonna cut out a handful of elevations, either that or use a PERT distribution instead of PERT percentile Z. So I'll do it um, both ways just so you can see how um, things change. So I'm gonna go ahead and flag those elevations. I think these were the ones I told you to pull out. Um, and the reason those, you'll notice how close those percentiles are to each other. And even when you are um, trying to go with, you know, the consistent percentile sampling, they can still kind of cross and cause issues. All right, so. Got total risk opened up here. Uh, the, the first thing that we're going to need to do is to create the hazard. So our hazard was given to us in tabular form. So we'll right click and click add tabular hazard. I'll call it stage frequency. So for this first one, let's go ahead and do per percentile Z, and then I'm actually going to make another one just for the uh, standard PERT distribution so we can see how both results and what difference it makes. So for based on the data that was given to us, uh, the uncertain value is the probability. You're given the hazard and then you're given different percentiles for the probability. So we'll select probability from that dropdown and then PERT percentile Z for the distribution. So I'm gonna then go to the homework six file and we will pull this entire set. And I can just paste that in here with control V, or I could have also hit the little clipboard up there. And that pulls it in. So then once my data is in, if I wanted to um, delete rows, I can just highlight those, then hit this icon with the red X, and that will pull those out. And you'll watch, you'll see how when I do that, this little point will come off and it'll get a little smoother. So now I have a not quite as sharp a change. So I think that should help things run. If you had done the um, standard PERT, and we'd add a tabular hazard, I'll call this one stage frequency two, we would just select probability again. It's already set for the PERT distribution. And I should just be able to copy and paste directly in and be done. So on and so forth. So you can see how the, the bounds change a little bit from one to the other. We're actually trying to, by using the PERT percentile Z, we're trying to be as faithful to um, whatever our hydrologic engineer gave us and trying to hit those specific percentiles as we're going through. Um, Troy, I see your comment there about um, it crashing on you and adding the PERT. My guess is you probably had it as something else and then when you changed it and pasted it in, that's when it crashed. That does that to me as well. I don't wanna do that here because I don't wanna have to reopen total risk, but uh, I have told the developers about that. I'm not it's on their list to fix. As a yeah, I didn't do it as a as a separate 
hazard like you did. I was, I think, probably changing it. So yeah, that, that's probably what did it. Thanks. Yeah. No. no. Yeah, and I, I'm sure it did it for most everyone. Um, they're still combing through the last little bit of bugs before they publish this thing for real. So hopefully they get that fixed. All right. So we've got our stage frequency curves in there. Uh, we'll run the analysis both ways. Our the next thing we need to do is to get our system response um, set up. And we've got three failure modes. The first one is overtopping, which looks like it is a four node event tree. Uh, PFM2 is an eight node event tree. And I think PFM3 is also an eight node event tree. Now in the most, most if not all of the examples I did in the module six presentation, um, we used templates for the system response. And those are available to us, but because of how some of these nodes are set up, I think I gave you inadvertently, gave you some, um, like overtopping has um, four nodes in the homework, but on here, let's see what we get. One, two, three, four. We have up to five nodes, for example. So that's not super helpful. I didn't, um, in the homework, I didn't give you the short descriptions for the nodes, so you, it's hard to tell which is which. So what I'm going to do instead, instead of using the template, let's go ahead and build these from scratch. So I'm going to call this one PFM1 overtopping. So when I start building from scratch, it'll give me, you know, one branch with fail and no fail, and then I can click here on the Go to the red circle and then click the pluses out until I have the number of nodes that I want. Now, I like things to be named certain ways. I think it'd be helpful just to keep things straight, go through and rename these node one, node two, node three, node four. And really, you can, I, I think that you can name these um, non-fail branches of the tree, whatever you want. They're using remainder, so I'll go ahead and do the same thing here. That would be remainder 1-1. So that would be at least the basic structure of the first event tree. Um, before I put the data in, I'm going to go ahead and copy this one and get a head start on PFM2. And then that one was eight nodes. So I'll keep adding until I've got those. And then conveniently, uh, PFM3 is also going to be eight nodes. So once I have this built, I'm just going to copy that one over. before I start inputting all the nodal data. All right, so that's the basic structure for number two. And then again, I, I can copy DFM3, and that one should be concentrated leak erosion. All right, so I've got my the structure for my three event trees. So now I'm going to um, start inputting my data. So let's go ahead and pull this sheet up and kind of go side by side. All right, so to start with, I need to define the peak pools that are going to be evaluated for this event tree. And they're all the same for each node for PFM1. That's going to be this set right here. So I'm going to copy that. And then in total risk, I'm going to click on um, the fan, the blue fan for where it says hazard. And it has the hazard levels that we're going to evaluate. There are one, two, three, six total. 
So I'm going to press the plus sign until I get up to six of them and then paste those values in. Okay. So then when I move forward to subsequent nodes, my hazard levels are going to be defined for each of those nodes going forward. Okay. So then for node one, we're told to use a triangular distribution um, given this data here. So I can copy that. Node one source is multi-value, multi-value in a sense that I'm going to evaluate each hazard level and then pick a distribution. So we're told triangular for this one. So we'll pick that and then I can, oops, wrong spot, click in here and paste the min most likely and max in from the homework file. Okay. So that covers node one and I'll repeat that for each node until I have the tree filled out. So this one is also triangular. Paste that in. Node three. This is an intervention node. But there's nothing special in total risk about um, intervention nodes or not. And I'll show you, after I get all these set up, I'll show you what we would have to do if we wanted to look at something without intervention. So I've got node three in there, and then node four. Okay. So if I've got those incorrectly, the, I click on the response, our system response should look something like this. Um, because we're dealing with an overtopping failure mode, we're not going to mess with any of the interpolation transforms. So I'm going to leave it as none for both the hazard and the probability. In doing so, it's going to keep everything on a linear scale and it's going to interpolate linearly. Okay. Any questions on PFM1? So then for PFM2, we're going to go through that exact same process. We just have more nodes and different hazard levels to evaluate. So scrolling down, the first node that's dependent on stage is node 3. So those are the values that we are going to want to grab. We'll click on the hazard fan. We will add our five branches. There's five stages for this one and then paste those in. Um, this one, I do want to change the interpolation transform. We're going to go log for probability. So basically that's like um, semi-log when we're doing things in the um, QRA calc. So it's linear for stage, which is the hazard, and then logarithmic for probability. All right. So our first node here, I've got the same value in for um, these two peak stages. So basically what that's telling me is that this is independent of stage. So I've got a couple options here. I can put the same value in for all of these stages, or I can change the source to single value and triangular and then just punch these in. So it's 0 0.3, oops, it's 0.3. 0.7, So whatever stage it's looking at, it's going to use this single value across the board for it. And by single value, the single distribution. So in node two, we're going to do the same thing. The triangular, except it's going to be single source. And then I want 0 0.7, 0 0.85, and 0.99. Something like that. I get that right. Point seven eight five nine nine. Okay. Node three. This one is stage dependent, so we'll copy and paste that guy in. Always click in the table, else it'll paste it where the name is, which gets a little annoying. Uh, node four. No 
code five is going to be another state's independent one. I'll do this one differently. We'll just go ahead and do triangular. And I'll copy that, that same value all the way through. This will do the exact same thing as if I had changed and done a single source. Uh, then node six, it's like a kind of a pass through node, single value. Since I don't have um, a distribution here, I'll leave it as deterministic. And I can just punch a value of one in for that one. Um, sometimes when we go through an elicitation, if something's really certain or um, we just don't have much uncertainty associated with it, we might not assign a distribution. So a node value can be deterministic. And when it is, it won't necessarily always be one. It's, it just is in this example. All right, two more to go. So node seven, that one is pool dependent. Node eight is pool dependent. All right, so if I've done that one right, the stage frequency curve should look something like this. Um, because we are um, transforming the probability to logarithmic, a better way to display this would it be to put that in a log scale. So to do that, I can right click over here and click um, format axis. And I can change that type to whatever I want. So if I did it logarithmically, again, you can see how that approximates a straight line pretty well. Okay. Questions on PFM2? Question. Yeah. With PFM2, because you have that one node, which one? Okay, node six, it was just a most likely value of one. Mm -hmm. If you just got rid of that node and didn't include it, would you get the same results or would it yes. be different? Okay. Yes, 100%. That's, that's so, how I got around the issue of having seven nodes versus eight in the template. That, that works um, okay. because I didn't give you what the actual nodes stand for, but. Um, yeah, whether you include that node or not won't change the risk calculations at all, but I do think it's important to include it in your event tree because that is an event that has to occur to get you to failure. So that way, you know, when you're going through a risk assessment, you've got your potential failure mode description, and you break that description down into an event tree, all the events that have to occur need to be there regardless of what their probability is. So yeah, from a calculation standpoint, it won't change anything, but it best practice would be to include it though. Very good, yep. Awesome. All right, so that is that one. And we're gonna do the same thing for PFM3. I'll, I'll just kind of walk through it and do a little less talking on this one since we just did it. Um, tools that we're going to need to pull from. Uh, node 2 is the first one that is stage dependent. So we'll grab that guy. Got five as well. Paste those in. And then the rest is just a lot of copying and pasting. So I always click the triangular distribution first before I change the source and then it makes me do it a second time. But 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 0 0.7. For node one. Node two. So node three is a single source. 
0105 and 0.1, I think that's right. Okay, and then node 5, 2685. Node 6, for whatever reason, is also a pass-through node, just like we saw in the other failure mode. And then Node 7 and 8 should both be pool-dependent. All right, so like we did for uh, PFM2, we're going to um, transform the probability logarithmically. So if we did everything right, system response should look something like that. And then if we change the axis, Look something like that. So anytime you have a zero point and you try to transform it and it needs to be in log, it's going to override that. In the spreadsheets, we were using 10 to the minus 20. They're using 10 to the minus 16 in RMC total risk. And that's more or less arbitrary as to why they chose minus 16 versus 15 or 20 or some other super low number. Okay. So that gets us our system responses. Um, so next, we will move into uh, our consequences. So we will need, let's see, we're going to need six, we have um, four different scenarios, breach day, breach night, non-breach day, non-breach night, but we're going to need two other functions in total risk to create our composite so that we can weight them by the exposure. And we're told to use the PERT distribution for both sets. So we're going to right click and add a tabular consequence. This will be for each day. And told to use a PERT distribution. Hazard types already staged, the units for the hazard are feet, life, lost, lives. So I should be able to just grab this, copy, and paste, and we're all set. Now, I know this looks a little funky where you have this big drop. That's actually not all that uncommon for um, some dams because of the, the second warning that's received when you have spillway flow. So you've got basically sunny day failures up to top of active storage. And then once you get above that, a lot of people are already getting warned for spillway releases. That's why you see a decent drop before it starts to increase up again, All right? Um, we do our consequence stuff uh, with linear, so we don't need any hazard or consequence um, transforms. If our hazard had been, um, Outflow, for example, then we would, might want to consider transforming that logarithmically, but since we're stage, we'll leave that as none for linear. All right, we'll do the same thing for all these other ones, and I'm going to just go ahead and build them all out, or at least create them here. So we got for each night, and then I need, oops, not a new group. Why well, won't let me delete it? Ungroup. There we go. Not delete. All right. So add one for the non breach day and then the non breach night. Okay. Let's go ahead and fill those in. Perk distribution. So this one is breach night. 
rid of that whole table. So something like that. And then non breach day, which has a bunch of zeros in there. And then non breach night. So now that we have those in, we can now make our composite. So I'll right click again and add a com uh, composite consequence. We're going to need one for breach, and we're going to need one for non breach. And both of them, we're going to, the composite type is going to be a mixture because I'm bringing in two different functions. I've got the functions that I've set for day and night. This one's for breach. And then I've got my exposures. So I'm weighting those by the exposure. So day's gonna be 0.45 and night's gonna be 0.55. And it combines them together to get a composite consequence function. It's doing it in this step instead of I guess keeping them separate like RMC QRA calcs does, but in the end, it's you're going to get the same result. Just doing it kind of at different times. So then we'll do the same thing for the non-breach, except I need to grab the non-breach day and the non-breach night. Okay. That should be all set. I'm going to go ahead and save this now just in case we run into any issues um, running the simulation. And you'll notice how we've got stars on each of our, um, each piece. Please don't break. Oh, it's taking too long. I don't know where it saved it, but it, there we go. I'm just being impatient. We'll call this homework six. All right, and you'll notice once things have saved, those stars go away. So anytime you add something that's new to the model, that star will be there to let you know it, that it has not been saved. All right, so with that, I've got the inputs to all three parts of the risk equation, hazard system response and consequences. So I am able to now um, create my risk analysis. So this first analysis here, analysis one, this is gonna be with the per percentile Z stage frequency relationship. So to build these out, you go to this plus sign, I then pick my hazard, and then I can use the drop down to pick which one I want. I'm going to pick the first one for here. Then I can go out here to the circle and then add my response. And I'm going to have to add, well, hold on, before I do that, I always have to have a connection between hazard and the non-breach consequences. So I think it's always best to do that at the top of the tree. So I will cl click add consequence and pick the non-breach. And that's it needs to be in there if it's going to calculate the incremental risk correctly. So now once that's in, I can add my system responses. So I've got PFM1, I'll add one for PFM2, and then add one for PFM3, and then each of those has their associated breach consequences, which in this case they were all the same, that's not always going to be the case. Um, so you'll have to go through and pick, you know, the, the correct consequence function for your failure mode. And you'll notice once I did that, all these lines turn green. Green means go. I have no errors. I have a valid uh, risk analysis that I can run. I can run the mean risk only, or I can simulate with uh, full uncertainty. Let's see if 
removing those pools is going to be good enough for 10,000. I think it worked for most people. Some are only able to run 5,000. Um, we'll see what happens here. Um, for our failure mode method, you guys were told to use competing risk, and this is where you would choose that. Um, we've talked about all those different um, risk models. Uh, you've got the joint model, competing risk, uh, common cause, and then mutually exclusive. So um, generally speaking, joint failures is going to give you the best result, um, but to try to be consistent with what we did in homework five, we were asked to use competing failures. So I've got that there, and we should be set and ready to go. Let's see what happens here. And what you found is, I hope you found it's a little more intuitive, a little easier to use than uh, RMC QA calcs, and it's certainly a lot faster to run a simulation. All right, we got a winner. So then up here we can go through, we can see our big FN plot, pulls it up with the incremental, and you can toggle on the background or non-breach risk. You can toggle on the total or residual risk. And then you also have these failure and non-failures. So those are, um, you know, these two things are complements. So what the failure is doing is it's taking the failure probability and using the breach consequences. So it's going to follow similar to the incremental, but have slightly higher consequences because we're not subtracting out the non-breach consequences when doing that. So you can see how it comes a little bit higher. And then the non-failure is going to be the complement to that, not necessarily the 100% um, reliable case that you would see for the background. So those are going to be really close to each other generally, but a little bit different. Okay. Um, if I want, I can go down to the risk analysis and I can actually see the FN plots for each of the individual failure modes if I want. So you can kind of turn things on and off as you want. Um, we go over here to the uh, alpha eta plot. Uh, eventually, I think the core is going to change their terms instead of doing FN, it's going to be alpha, eta. I must confess I don't fully understand the, the reason or what, but that's coming in the future. So that's going to be our little FN plot. This is with intervention, so you see we plot just a little bit below um, really where all the guidelines meet, where we've got our low probability, high consequence um, lines that create this box down the corner, and then also the average annual life loss line. So we're just a smidge below. Um, we can turn on each of the failure modes, and you can also customize these plots as you want by right-clicking. You can change their colors, you know, make things, you know, present however you'd like to see them. Let's turn those off again. And then you also have the summary statistics where you can um, pull the data for both probability, that's going to be your APF, um, this conditional mean, that's your N bar, and then the mean here, that's going to be your average annual life loss. So it can be a little confusing going back and forth between um, this program and then kind of what we've talked about up through this module in the course and some of the terms we use in the future. Like I said, the course is going to be changing their terms and uh, we're going to be more consistent from one thing to the next. Uh, you can also pull in and see um, 
like this big, how the different failure modes rack and stack as well. And when you pull in a failure mode, that's not the contribution to the total, that is gonna be the marginal estimate for that potential failure mode. Okay. Any questions on that? Um, and then from here, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna run a new analysis, but use just the PERT distribution to show how the result changes. So any, any questions before doing that? Damon, this is Michael. Yeah. I, I, I hesitate to ask this question because you previously explained how the, say the non-breach risk was not presented correctly and you showed how you had to make an adjustment to get that to display properly in the FN chart. And when you click yeah. through the residual and the complement and the various alternatives, it, is that where you would do a quality check to see if somebody botched that? Like I feel like the difference between the complement of the uh, hazard without regard to incremental consequences, just total consequences compared to something else. Like that might be how a reviewer would know that we messed it up earlier on by not accounting for the, the foible in the chart that you explained. I have to take extra steps to properly show, I think, the non-breach consequences. Yeah, so, so what you're referring to is for special cases, and that is when we have to use a composite hazard. So I don't have any transforms in this example in the homework because we didn't need one. I'm going stage and everything that I have, response, consequences, both breach and non-breach are all a function of stage. If I had had gate inoperability, and I can pull up one of those models here in a little bit, I have you know, four stage frequency curves or however many I have that I'm waiting together to create a composite. In doing that, my hazard here would be composite. So it's lumping in the impacts of gate inoperability, which is in fact a failure mode. It's not 100% operability. So if I were to link that directly to non-breach, I have a, a bad relationship there. I, I, it's not true to what non-breach should be. So that's why we had to create that transform to go from composite stage to 100% reliable stage so that I could then link directly to the non-breach consequences. So if you can give me a minute, let me get through this homework and then I'll pull up. I think I still have that um, total risk file available. I'll pull that up and show you again the difference and why we need it. But hopefully that made sense. I think so. Thank you. Yep. All right. So this is what the analysis looks like for the first one. Uh, the second one is going to look exactly the same, except I'm going to change the hazard. So I'll go ahead and copy that down, call it analysis two. But I'm going to use a different, I'm going to use the second stage frequency relationship. That's the only thing that changed. So now this one, I think, is the basic PERC distribution. So all my options, everything should have stayed the same, so I should be good to just click Estimate and let that guy run. And then we can either pull them on the same plot or either or toggle back and forth to see what difference it made. And what, what I think you're going to see, I haven't actually done this to, to verify, but my guess is that the uncertainty for the basic PERC distribution is going to be more narrow than um, what we used in the first analysis. Reason being, in the first one, we specified 50th and 95th percentiles, whereas in the second analysis, by just making those the inputs into a PERC distribution, that's now min most likely and max. Yeah, and we see that we plot in more or less the same spot. 
from one analysis to the next, but my uncertainty has gotten a lot smaller. Um, for those that had their point plot a little bit above, like in here, my guess is that probably did linear interpolation for both PFM2 and PFM3. So you can see like in this case, it made a ever so slight difference, you know, nine times 10 to the minus seven versus one and change times 10 to the minus six. Um, typically the, the change isn't super great. It's never more, generally never more than a factor of two or so. That's just been my experience. I, that's not like a hard and fast rule or anything, but all right. So those are those two analysis. Um, there's some also some handy features. If you go to diagnostics, you can, um, there's some different things here. You can see the PDF, you can see the CDF of your results. You can um, check the tornado plot to see, you know, what's, um, what the analysis is most sensitive to. Um, if you're dealing with levies, you can uh, look at NFIP assurance. We don't have all that stuff set up, so we don't have anything there. Um, you can also pull all the iteration results. Um, so this is for the APF for each failure mode in the total. Then you can cycle through the different things. This would be for average annual life loss, for example. Now, um, so depending on what you want to do with the data, there's some helpful things that are built in there. All right, so before getting, before getting out of this, um, a couple people had asked what to do with, how do you show like with and without intervention? So both of these analyses that we did were with intervention because we had the intervention nodes in there. If we wanted to take the intervention node out, the best way to do it is to go ahead and copy each of these. I'm going to call this without int. And then I would adjust these event trees to either you could pull out the node altogether, like in uh, PFM2 and, uh, and 3, it's node 7, I think it was. I'll double check that. But yeah, node 7 is an intervention node for both of those. And then in the first failure mode, it was the third one. So to do that, I can either go in here, I can make this a single value and just change that to a one. That's one way to do it, um, except I just did it in the wrong spot. So that's awesome. Go back to multi-value. Good, my data's still there. Um, I would want to do it here. The other option you can do is you can actually just delete that node out of the tree. Um, to do that, you're first going to have to copy this node, though. So if I go here to the node right here, I've got the option to delete all branches to the right, and I can copy all branches to the right. So if I were to copy node 4, delete node three and four, and then paste in node four, that's another way to do it without um, changing any of the probabilities, okay? Um, so I'm gonna do that for PFM2 as well. So we'll copy, delete, paste, and do the same thing here. And then we should be set. So then to actually get that analysis, I'm gonna to have to create a new analysis. It's gonna be set up much the same way as this one. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy 
it, but call it without intervention. And the only thing that changes, the state frequency is going to stay the same, the consequences are going to stay the same, but I want to pull the without intervention system response. I can move those out a little bit. So now it's doing the same thing, but I'm now using a system response relationship that does not have um, intervention in it. So I'm going to run the mean for this one just because that's super fast. And then we can see how the probability snuck up there a little bit. Whereas here, well, I changed something, so it, I have to rerun it. Let's run the mean. All right. So again, the mean with intervention is right below where those three lines meet, whereas with intervention, it's a touch higher because we took out that, that node. Does that make sense? So you would have to do something similar, like if you want the um, economic risk, the average annual economic cost, we would do something similar where we would build consequence functions here, and then we would copy our analysis, but instead of having breach consequences, we would pull the economic consequences instead. And you'd have to change your consequence unit to dollars instead of lives. Damon? Yes. Uh, analysis one without intervention, it's no intervention. Was higher. Thank you. I needed to say it. Thank you. <laughs> You're wondering why it went up. Yes. All good. Yeah, and intervention's a good thing. So without it, it's going to make things worse. <laughs> Anybody have any um, questions over anything that I just covered, or any of the other examples? Um, I'll answer those and then I'll pull up the, um, see if I can find an example that has a composite in there. Hi, Damon. Uh, it's Adam. I, <laughs> I ducked out because I'm still trying to work through the homework, so I didn't want to feel like I was cheating. But I, I did notice a couple of things as I was working through. Um, one thing I noticed was if you... You know, and through working through some of the examples, um, if you know, it's easy to just do a save as, but if you try to overwrite the uh, an existing hazard as opposed to deleting and re adding it, I noticed that it'll crash the program. So that was yep. something I observed. And, and maybe you covered that. And I'm sorry if you did, that I didn't know. Um, and then I, I would just, I noticed that the, <laughs> The template PFMs, there's a bunch preloaded for flood and seismic, but none for normal pool. Is that, I just was curious as to why that was. Uh, well, it, it's, it's less about normal pool and more about, I guess, what hazard is driving the failure mode. So for example, let, let's go ahead and add one of those. So if I've got a, let's, I don't know, let's pick concentrated leak erosion or whatever. The category is flood, but when I go here, I'm going to be evaluating all those hazard levels, including normal pool. So flood is just the hazard type, and then when we evaluate um, um, flood flood driven failure modes, we're looking at the full range of the loading, so everything from normal up to whatever our max higher PMF is. Okay. I guess I was thinking of failure modes like maybe mechanical failure modes for a gate or something that wouldn't necessarily be stage dependent, but uh, okay. I guess yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, so that's actually a good segue because those are the kind of things, like it, failure, you know, of a tainer gate, the spillway gate, that's going to impact your stage frequency curve. And as is how many of those gates you know, were to be inoperable. Um, 
so you would have different hazard relationships for each of those and then you would weight those together based on their probability and then so on and so forth so you would have that set so you can account for that there Those are the kind of things that aren't necessarily, they don't, they're not failure modes in a sense that they lead to breach on their own. They have to make something else worse. So those operational type failure modes often end up um, as part of the hazard. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so, because you guys are, or I shouldn't say you guys, but you're, the failure mode has to progress all the way to full breach of the dam, I guess is the assumption, right? There's nothing that, uh, you know, you're not really considering like a just loss of a single gate that may not be a full breach, that kind of thing. So, I, yeah, so I, I see where you're going with that, like you're tending to incorporate it into a, a failure mode that's going to progress all the way to a full breach of the dam. Correct. I mean, that is core methodology, but that's one of the nice things about the way total risk is set up is you have the flexibility to, again, structure your trees however you want. So if there's a particular damage state that you're interested in, you could customize and build that to do that. You don't have to take it. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that goes all the way out to breach. So I, I know that when they were putting this together, they weren't, they wanted it to be um, as multifaceted a tool as they could so that, you know, other agencies, you know, and other, um, I don't know if discipline's the right word, but um, other people can use it for different risk analysis purposes, not just dam and levy safety. That makes sense. And, and yeah, at FERC, you know, we're considering a lot of damage state PFMs, which may have consequences, may have life loss consequences, or may just have, you know, economic consequences to the owner. But um, they, there's some that don't go all the way to full breach. I mean, we certainly consider ones that go all the way to full breach, but we're considering some that do not, too, as part of our new right. L2RA process. So, yeah, that ability would be good. Right on. Uh, Mike, you asked if this is open source. I don't know. I mean, it, the, the the program itself is eventually going to get loaded up onto the RMC website and be available for anybody to use, but I don't know about code and um, stuff like that. I can, if you're really interested, I can point you to the developers. They're always happy to talk about it. All right, so before we sign off, I'm gonna go ahead and let's save this guy and then I'm gonna close it. Let's open up a, another one. I think this one has a composite in there. So to our question earlier about, again, transforms. So this is the second example from the module six presentation where we were given gate and operability. So I've got four different stage frequency relationships. And you'll notice how with each of them, the higher stages get a little more frequent each time because I'm losing more and more gates, basically. So when I take a composite and do that, that stage frequency relationship is obviously going to be different than what I've got for the zero gates inoperable. For the non-breach, by definition, that assumes 100% reliability, that everything's going to operate as intended. So I need to be using this curve to get the non-breach risk. But there's no real way to set that up in the risk analysis. I'm only allowed to choose one hazard. So to get things correct, 
I choose the composite hazard because that is going to be, that's going to impact all of my failure modes. But then to have the non-breach relationship, I need to be able to transform that back from, again, composite stage to whatever that stage would have been had the dam operated correctly. Um, there are other ways to set this up. You could have made your um, hazard a function of inflow instead, I think. How would that have worked? Yeah, so if you had the in, but even then, I, I, no. That's one of the ways we used to do it um, via spreadsheet or there's an older program called Damray where we would start with inflow and then we would have transforms from inflow to stage for each of the gate and operability um, uh, scenarios, but you can't do that in total risk. Sorry, I misspoke. So the only way to do it is to start with that composite hazard and then transform to 100% reliable stage, and then you've got your associated non-breach consequences after that. So that way, when you do get to this point, we will have the correct um, background curves, and then when it, is, when it does make this and this for the incremental, it's pulling the correct non-breach life loss, not something higher than it should have. So hopefully that makes sense. That made a lot of sense. Thank you. I think I get Good. it. Oh, so it does, oh, geez, I'm doing it to the whole group again. <laughs> You're good. I don't like the composite hazard for gates because you're exposing all of the failure modes to uh, stages that are randomly just more variable. You're just introducing more uncertainty because you don't know what gates fail. So you just take them all, force it into a composite, and now your hazard is adjusted and you expose all the failure modes to that adjusted hazard because gates will be doing stuff. But then we actually look at gate failure as a thing and we calculate the probability of each scenario and and in the end, the gate scenario is not going to be gate scenario is being handled correctly, and it looks like you don't you just introduce more uncertainty for all the other failure modes. I wouldn't say that you're at. I mean, you are. There is uncertainty associated with all of these, but again, each of these scenarios is going to have its own probability associated with it. And I think what you're getting at is that I don't think that changes any of the failure modes that I have here, per se. But if we did have one where you're basically talking about blowout of a painter gate, right? Well, if I'm saying if we use a composite hazard to account for the fact that one of our PFMs is, is gates or clogged trash racks, whichever, the actual condition right is a particular outcome and we correctly use competing risk to calculate the, the probabilities. But we introduce all of the gates as a possibility as a, a source of more variability for all of the other PFMs. That, and that is just correct? I think it, that's why I might be up, upside down about it is it might be just be correct. Yeah, so your composite hazard is basically, you know, what the SAGE frequency really is, right? Especially if you know that you could have inoperability of any number of gates, that's going to be your best estimate in a given year of, you know, of having, of reaching a, a, or exceeding a certain stage. If you don't include that and you just stay at the zero gates and operable, then you're underselling your flood risk. So it has to be in there. Now, okay, so. Now, what it is doing by including that, yes, you know, 
the reason, so I talked about this back in module three. Anytime that you've got data and operability or something like that, you want to run an analysis with that data and operability, and then you also want to run that analysis with zero gates and operable, a fully 100% reliable case. Because I think what you're getting at is by including gate and operability, I'm going to be showing higher risk for failure modes one, two, and three. Right? I, I think so, because you've introduced more variability into the hazard. Yeah. So the difference between those two runs, again, with gate and operability and you know, 100% reliability, that is the amount of risk that is directly attributable, attributable to the gates. That's what's the gates fault. Whereas the marginals for PFM 1, 2, and 3 would be tied to zero gates and operable. Okay, but most of our projects, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, actually they, they all have gates and trash racks. And so if you look at any failure mode that depends on stage as a hazard, you might not need to have the failure mode for gates or crash racks to evaluate risk, but you need to adjust your hazard. If, I mean, if it's correct so, and you actually have gates and trash racks, don't you need to incorporate the additional variability that that adds? Not necessarily. It depends on the okay. size of the conduit and, okay. you know, how things change. I mean, a lot of times, especially once you start getting up around top of active storage, you know, what you're releasing really isn't that much. So. Thank you. Uh, that, that, it, that's why. Yeah. Right. The, the so, H and H controls whether that matters. Correct. Yes. Cool. Thank you for everybody's time on that one. <laughs> All right. So if no one has any other questions, yes, James, I can, I'll, once we, um, let me wrap here and then um, I'll see if I can work through trying to get total risk working on your computer after we're done, if that's okay. All right, so with that, a um, couple things that we need to do. There's gonna be a module six quiz out there and I need to give you the buzzword. Um, you'll be happy to know that both for both module six and module seven, the, all the, those quizzes are gonna be one question quizzes and, there, and it's really just asking you what the buzzword is. So that's kind of nice. So for module six, uh, the buzzword is going to be continuous. Continuous. Um, so that'll be up there the same way that um, it's always been in the past. Or we can get to, um, here, I'll pull it up just as a reminder to everybody. So Sorry, again, you said that was continuous, correct? Continuous, yes. So like before, we'll go to Socrative, click student login, and then this time it'll be DLS 105 R6. I don't know if that's up and running just yet, but it, it should be here by the end of the day at the latest. Yeah, it, it's, it's not up just yet, but it'll, it'll be up very shortly. And again, the only, only thing you're gonna need there is for the buzzword. Um, moving forward, I will be. I need to get um, Kaylor to send out an email with, um, I guess the the class roster and what I've been tracking for submittals. Um, I think I've caught up with it, but there's times where if, if I wait too long, there's a lot of things that go through that RMC training um, email address. And if I missed something, I want to make sure that you get credit. So I will be 
um, having Taylor send out an email with that spreadsheet so you can check. Um, and if I happen to miss something, you can resend it and I'll give you credit. That's going to be for um, the homework assignments and the quizzes, making sure that we have everything submitted and you're getting credit for all the stuff that you did. Um, also today, all the module seven stuff will get posted. We'll start moving into, um, this will be the, the last module. Um, and it's a relatively simple thing. We've done all the hard stuff and now module seven scales it back and talks about semi-quantitative risk assessments and what that does to our calculations. And there's a, a toolbox associated with that that we'll walk through. Um, that's going to be a, a shorter presentation, not one of those, you know, hour and a half, two hour marathons that I put you through earlier. So module seven should be a, um, probably a welcome change when you get there. So, so if no, nobody has anything else, again, I appreciate your all's continued participation through this. Um, one more module to go. Uh, we'll have office hours coming up. I think it's next week. I did, but be sure to check the, uh, the course schedule in your uh, participant workbook, and we will go from there.